So hello, my name is Thomas Grove. I'm one of the co-creators of Cilium uh, and the CTO and co-founder of iSurveillant, the company behind Cilium. Before founding iSurveillant, I have been a kernel developer for many years working on networking, security, and eBPF. In this talk today, I will be sharing my thoughts on the future of eBPF-based networking and security. Specifically, we will answer the question, why is eBPF the future and how will this future look like? Before we can look into this future, we need to take a quick look at the past. So let's briefly look at the history of networking. In the 90s, uh, it's a long while ago, networking was almost entirely physical, cables, perimeters, and a lot of layer two, hardware and layer two. This was also the era of dial-up modems. For those of who you remember, for those of you who remember these times, I've link, included a link where you can listen to the sounds of dial-up modems and related equipment. For those of, who, of you who don't, also listen and remember that those sounds were once associated with excitement. Around the same time, 1999, IP tables was created by Rusty Russell as a uh, successor for IP chains. And shortly after, PF was released by Daniel Hartman, Hartmeyer for, for BSD. Both projects focused on software-based firewalling and were primarily designed to protect the host or replace hardware-based firewalls. In the year 03, VLANs were first described. The first release of the Xen hypervisor happened and EMC acquired VMware. This was the start of the virtualization era. KVM was first merged into the Linux kernel just a couple of years later in 07. However, from a networking perspective, nothing much changed. Networking uh, of virtual machines was delegated to the underlying physical network by bridging VMs directly to the network with layer two bridges. Almost no network logic existed in software. Most of the focus in networking in the Linux kernel was on the TCP IP stack or optimizing Linux as an operating system to run applications. It was the year 2009 when things got exciting again from a software networking perspective. It was the year of the first open vSwitch release. Th these were the early days of software-defined networking or SDN. It brought massive programmability, virtual networks and overlays to Linux. This was the start of the network virtualization era and led to a massive move of networking logic from hardware into software. 2010 was also the year of the first OpenStack Summit. I'm sure many of you remembered that as well. Going further, year 2013 brought us Docker. Docker from a networking perspective primarily inherited the networking from the, from the virtualization layers. Uh, and containers were treated pretty much like miniature VMs. Uh, the fundamental shift brought by Docker initially focused on application packaging with container images and not necessarily on the infrastructure side. Almost all of the early networking solutions for containers were inherited from OpenStack days. In 2014, something exciting happened again. The first commit to Kubernetes happened. Kubernetes was obviously not the first to attempt to translate high-level user intent into infrastructure automation, but it made unique choices to make a lot fewer assumptions in networking security and many other aspects which define how infrastructure is configured. For example, there is no concept of a network or subnet in Kubernetes. This allowed for a massive innovation. The era of containers begins. But Kubernetes also wanted to get a complete enough state as quickly as possible, so it heavily relied on IP tables, which was at the time the most widely available way to perform networking, uh, network filtering on Linux. Well, IP tables was created while some of us still use dial-up modems, so it's not surprising that the underlying design of IP tables is not a perfect match for modern cloud native workloads. So how does eBPF fit in? Well, in the same year that Kubernetes started, eBPF was first merged into the Linux kernel. And just one year later, the eBPF backend was merged into the LLVM compiler suite, allowing for LLVM to emit eBPF bytecode. 
Also, a new eBPF classifier made Linux networking programmable with eBPF for the first time. And finally, the BCC project was announced, which would later revolutionize application profiling and tracing. And now, as we see, BPF Trace is succeeding BCC as well. 2016, XTP was merged into the Linux kernel, enabling a high performance data path where eBPF can run directly in the driver of a network device, as close to the hardware as possible. This, would, this is what later unlocks the development of several load balancer that, now, that are now used uh, in some of the largest data centers today. It was also the year we first announced the Cilium project. Cilium had and still has a very simple goal, provide networking, security, and observability for Kubernetes and cloud-native environments using eBPF. It has been designed from scratch to leverage all the powers of eBPF in a native way. What does that mean specifically? Let's have a look. Looking at this from left to right, we have started with hardware networking where the functionality and scale are mostly predefined by the hardware. This applied long innovation cycles and was designed for the age of physical servers. We went through the era of software defined networking, which moved a lot of logic from, from software, or from hardware to software. It did so by bringing hardware networking concepts into software. We literally took functionality previously done in hardware, wrote it in software, and slapped the word virtual in front. This is obviously a bit harsh and simplified, but think of this era to still think in programmable flow tables, IP addresses, and ports. The programmability was clearly networking specific, but it brought an amazing set of innovation for the age of virtual machines. What is different with Cilium and eBPF? As you, as you have heard at this summit, eBPF is used for much more than networking. It is getting closer and closer to a general purpose execution engine. So from a programmability perspective, it's much more powerful than any programmable flow table. Brandon just mentioned this in his last keynote. He has been talking about like BPF, a new, BPF as a new type of application running in kernel space. I think this is, this is mapping very well to this. Solium translates high-level intent defined by the user, for example, in Kubernetes, directly into code. You could think of this as networking as code if you want. It means that we can decouple networking from the security and visibility layers entirely, which has incredible benefits as we steer towards multi and hybrid cloud use cases, multi-cluster use cases, and attempt to bridge traditional data centers uh, with modern cloud deployments. Cilium understands the security identity of applications and application level protocols such as HTTP and DNS. But most importantly, it makes the networking layer application aware by utilizing eBPF at layers above the networking think system calls and sockets, while remaining completely transparent to applications. This allows building a networking and security layer specifically designed for Kubernetes and the cloud native age. Back to the history. Even though we had announced Cilium and the vision was very clear, we were still in the building phase. In parallel, Brandon Gregg, who we heard earlier, uh, started talking about Linux BPF superpowers with amazing presentations on eBPF for tracing. Facebook revealed using an eBPF and XDP based load balancer replacing IPVS at 10x performance. I think a lot of us still remember the moment where those slides were shared. This was later released under the project Katron or Katron. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it correctly and I haven't had my shot of vodka yet. In the same year, Cloudflare shared their plans to perform DDoS mitigation with eBPF. 2018, Cilium 1.0 was released big moment for us. Um, and obviously we also released 1.1 and 1.2 in the same year, which extended the feature set massively. It brought things like Kubernetes cluster IP load balancing, FQDM policies, and multi-cluster networking. It was also the year BTF was merged into the kernel that made the kernel self-descriptive. This later unlocked shine features in the tracing world. In 2019, BPF Trace was announced, which is providing a higher level abstraction compared to BCC, and it was another giant leap forward for, for tracing. We just heard about this in Brandon's keynote. We also released Cilium versions 1.4 to 1.6 with things like IPv LAN support, transparent encryption, 
eBPF templating, a full queue proxy replacement, so you can get rid of those IP tables rules, CNI chaining to operate with other CNIs, and socket-based load balancing, and even an AWS ENI mode to natively integrate it with cloud provider networks. These days, we also have the same for GKE, as we just heard in the last keynote. But even more exciting, we released a Hubble open source project, an eBPF-based visibility platform for network, service, and security visibility. Finally, clearly another major milestone was the release of Brandon's new book, BPF Performance Tools, and now he's just about to, I think, releasing uh, the second versions of system performance, which may have found its place as the de reference book for eBPF already. It's not the only book on eBPF, of course, but possibly the most complete at this point. This brings us to today. Um, this year, Cilium 1.7 and 1.8 have already been released, which brought XDP based load balancing with DSR, similar to how it is done with Katra. Uh, the ability to protect the host itself with eBPF, as well as things like session affinity for load balancing. Obviously, another major milestone for eBPF-based networking, and specifically the Cilium project, was Google's announcement this year regarding the availability of their new networking data plane for GK, which is Google's Kubernetes engine built entirely on Cilium and eBPF. Now, already looking a bit into the future, in a couple of weeks, we will be releasing Cilium 1.9, which will bring maglev support, consistent hashing, a bandwidth manager, deny policies, VM support, or more generally speaking, support for external workloads running on VMs or metal outside of Kubernetes, and things like T-proxy support with eBPF. So what is next? We will see various things. We will see more eBPF at the edge load balancing with eBPF and XDP. We heard from Laurent yesterday how Datadog is looking to move into this direction with Cilium. There are several eBPF-based options already, which are quite opinionated. Cilium will focus on a general purpose implementation to bring the speed, visibility, and flexibility of eBPF and make it consumable for Kubernetes and cloud-native environments. We, all, we already have done big steps by enabling XDP-based load balancing and the introduction of maglev and session affinity. We will also continue the evolution into more application awareness. Cilium already provides socket-based load balancing. We will continue down this path and provide things like intra-pod network policies to improve the security and continue to evolve socket-to-socket -socket networking, which which is particularly important for sidecar-based service mesh architectures. We have heard about this from MassMobile yesterday in order to scale Istio properly. However, most importantly, you will see Cilium unlock another giant leap in security by bringing what we have applied to networking, by combining networking and system call awareness to the runtime security world. We have heard from KP yesterday how Google is investing into an eBPF-based LSM for runtime security. Personally, I think the strict borders between network security and runtime security will go away, and a solution with mutual awareness and more context will fundamentally improve the security model. And then obviously it sounds a bit boring, but focus on metal and virtual machine workloads will be vital in 2021 and beyond, as we see more and more users migrate to Kubernetes. Connectivity to and from existing data centers, multiple cloud providers, and bridging virtualized workloads that are hard to migrate with modern containerized workloads will be a big focus. Finally, Cilium already provides a lot of service mesh functionality, which is no surprise. We all share the same desire to provide connectivity, security, and visibility for cloud-native workloads. The major difference will be that Cilium can provide the same with very efficient, low cost, and fully transparent means by integrating service mesh concepts directly into the Linux operating system using eBPF. Concluding all of this, I think we will see a massive adoption of eBPF in the cloud native world. You will see more eBPF at the edge with load balancing that includes visibility and security concepts already known in the Kubernetes world. In Kubernetes, at the networking, um, service connectivity, network policy, and at the multi-cluster level. A lot of this is already reality with the Cilium CNI. We'll see massively improved observability. Um, we have heard about this. We have heard about many tracing examples throughout the summit. A lot of this will come to Kubernetes as well. eBPF will bring value to VM and metal fleets by connecting them to Kubernetes in a identity-aware way 
and by allowing VM and NETL workloads to be represented in Kubernetes environments. Finally, on the host, eBPF will melt runtime and network security together. Why should we have fundamentally, why should we have fundamentally differences between APIs and system calls? They can both do harm. Last but not least, eBPF will obviously continue to redefine application profiling, tracing, and system troubleshooting on the host. With this, I'm looking into a very bright future with eBPF uh, for networking and security and open it up for questions. I quickly have to check in the Slack channel where the thread is. I have a see a first question from Nico. Does T proxy support mean Istio sidecars can have a fully BPF, a full BPF data path in Cilium 1.9? Uh, we are almost there, and there is a Istio upstream issue which is talking about and designing BPF native uh, sidecar injection. Uh, T proxy can be one building block of this, but T proxy does require privileges, so it may not be the best solution for Istio. We, however, we will provide a BPF based sidecar um, injection strategy for Istio in the near future. Second question, Julius. Would you say that eBPF for networking as code could completely replace the use of OVS and provide greater performance uh, or simplicity? Any disadvantages that you can think of with this potential switch? Um, great question. Um, I can't think of any disadvantages and I think that's a bit natural because many of us have actually worked on OVS in our past and we're all very proud of what we have built with OVS. I see eBPF-based solutions and Cilium as a natural evolution on, on, on top of something like OVS. It, it, it inherits the programmability aspect, but goes even further in terms of programmability and obviously is, is built for um, Kubernetes and cloud native roles. Then I see a question, what is the future of BPF outside of Kubernetes? So if, from a Cilium perspective, we have, we have focused a lot on Kubernetes early on, but none of what we have built is very Kubernetes specific. Um, in the next release, or in, actually in 1.9, which is what we will release in just a bit, we will um, release a new agent mode that will allow Cilium to run on VMs and, agent, on VMs and metal um, machines, and thus embed these machines into your Kubernetes environment. Going forward, we might actually also support uh, running in a hypervisor mode. Um, so I think as we go further, we will, we will expand more and more into uh, the space outside of Kubernetes. What was important to us from the beginning is that from a design perspective, we are Kubernetes and cloud native first, and then we expand into different, into, into different uh, worlds. I see Ra Raimundo is asking, this will be a hybrid of SDN LO level from VMs, or will there be a hypervisor? I'm not sure I fully understand this question. Remember, you may have to clarify that a little bit. So I will go to Mars's question. A lot of telco applications depend on availability of DPDK, SRI, OV for network performance and networking. It's the most difficult block when migrating from VNFs to CNFs. Can you talk more about Cilium usage for specialized workloads in telco or finance roles? Um, yes, I can talk to this. We are working with, with several telcos right now to uh, enable what we will call workloads that require network access directly, uh, in particular in combination with SRIOE. We will be releasing this work um, over the next couple of months. So definitely chat with us um, if you have interest in this. There's nothing public right now, but we are happy to, to include you in the discussions we have. <laughs> 